Welcome to Kidney Talk, a program of Renal Support Network, a show that streams health, happiness, and hope to the kidney community. You can download all Kidney Talk shows from iTunes and find a variety of resources to help you navigate this illness at rsnhope.org. Please welcome your host, Lori Hartwell, who has lived with kidney disease since the age of two. Well, welcome to Kidney Talk, everyone. Well, today we're going to be speaking to Anna Rutherford. She's a senior manager of social work services at Fresenius Kidney Care. And today we're going to be talking about the role of the social worker. Welcome to the show, Anna. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. So uh, tell us what led you to choose the field of social work, then the field of kidney care. Sure. That's actually a really important question, and I appreciate you asking, Lori. I decided to go into social work. This is my second career. My first career was in nonprofit management. I managed a large animal shelter, uh, so I love animal behavior. And I found myself working diligently to educate individuals on how to better care for their animals and talking to them about things that were sensitive. And it really drove my passion to work more closely with people. So animal behavior came first and is now more of a hobby of mine. And I started to lean more towards wanting to work directly with people. So I started studying social work. And once I realized the doors that would open, medical social work seemed to be a great fit for me because I am a type 1 diabetic. So someone with a chronic illness obviously can relate to others that struggle with chronic illnesses as well. So landing in the field of nephrology uh, made sense to me because the population I work with are kind of like me and I can relate very much to them. Well, and it, it's so true. I mean, you know, you deal with all the emotions of the Kubler-Ross motions of shock, denial, fear, anger, depression, grief, and then finally understanding acceptance. So it doesn't matter what illness you have. Um, you have to go through those stages. How much schooling was involved for you to become a social worker? So I have an undergrad, which took four years, And I have an undergrad in philosophy and an undergrad of fine arts. (laughs) So that didn't (laughs) lead directly into social work. You sound like an interesting friend. (laughs) Dogs, art, um, and philosophy (laughs) and kidney disease. We may be BFFs. I think think so. (laughs) And add travel and food. And that's me in a nutshell. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, move to L.A. (laughs) Yes. And then I went and got my master's, and that was a two-year program. And so graduate school took two years. So a total of six years with maybe a little bit of time in between. Okay. Well, and uh, I mean, did you go to school online or did you go to a physical school? And there's so many options nowadays. There are. My undergraduate uh, degrees I received from University of New Mexico, so the Southwest. um, I love the climate there. And then my graduate degree, I attended in person at North Carolina State University, and I currently live in Raleigh, North Carolina. Well, um, so, you know, explain a little bit of what the role of the nephrology social worker is, because this is a unique thing, because Medicare pays for dialysis, and the payment for treatment includes the social worker, which is unusual. No other health care specialty, I believe, does that. Right, absolutely. It's a complicated role, for sure. We are the only ones that can do what we do in this Uh, in nephrology, which is we focus on behavior and focus on coping and adjustment and supporting our patients to live life to what they define as their best quality. So we meet the patient where they are and we help them obtain the goals that they set for themselves by providing, you know, we, we can provide case management staff, things like referrals to resources But our main thing is to help invoke or evoke quality of life and their best quality possible with the resources that they have. So 
they might have a day that is a little bit harder than others and we're there to support them through that day. Or they might have a day that is exciting and successful and we're there to celebrate with them. So our process as the nephrology social worker is to walk side by side with the patient through their entire dialysis journey from start to finish, whether that's um, discontinuing or transplant, which is really the optimal end result. Well, and you know, it's a reality when you have any illness, but depression and anxiety are often at a high level. Um, you know, what tools do you help give the your patients to deal with, you know, all the conditions that overwhelm them? <laughs> Sure. <laughs> Dealing we have with so it. Many. I know. Yeah. We have so many. Um, Versinius offers programs and different interventions that the social workers can provide to the patient. We call them focused interventions. We have about 80 different intervention tools that we can utilize from motivational interviewing to quality of life ladder to how to live your best life. So, and rebalancing your life with kidney disease. We have numerous interventions that help patients define or redefine life as a dialysis patient. Um, And we also have a lot of tools and interventions that help with coping and adjustment, depression, struggling with anxiety, what those things mean. And not only is it patient-facing, but we also have things that we can help with care partners as well. So there's uh, multiple touch points that we have as social workers to help patients when they're struggling and when they might be having a hard day. Uh, we have multiple interventions available. Well, and I know for me, when I was growing up on dialysis, if I didn't have my dog, <laughs> I, mm. I, you know, animals, you got to find what you need. And, and, you know, animals were a big part of my life or my little black poodle, Peppy, you know, I had, you know, I had, I had to take care of myself to take care of him. And that was my motivation some days of just getting out of bed because he needed to be walked. And then, you know, I got into arts and crafts and I mean, these were all strategies that I developed over the years. And you have to have, uh, you know, extremely good coping skills <laughs> mm-hmm. to deal with an illness. Um, and it's great that, you know, people have access to these, you know, this information. Yeah, absolutely. You know, but it's tough. I mean, it's tough to rely on a machine to live. And it's you got to do some mental gymnastics to get used to it. Um, oh, 100%. <laughs> Isn't it crazy? And if we could all, if we're only the animal lovers out there, because I wouldn't want to force it on those that are not huge animal advocates, if we could all sit in a treatment chair with a cuddly little pop on our lap, I mean, it, or a large dog that we can just pet during the process, right. I, I think it would just make life so much easier and the process so much easier for, for our patients. And, you know, there was just a study published about, you know, compliance uh, went up a little bit when, you know, animals were in the dialysis clinic. And as somebody, I mean, animal therapy, it's it's proven in hospitals. I mean, I, you know, when I've been in the hospital, they always know to bring a dog to me if I'm upset. And it, it helps me. It's better than an Ativan. And uh, it's so funny because, um, you know, if it wasn't for my black poodle growing up, I often think I would not be here. And subsequently, I've had lots of dogs since him. Um, but, um, we are poodle fans in this household, too. Oh, my God. But um, <laughs> my husband and I started a rescue a year and a half ago. Oh, wonderful. And we have adopted about 80 animals. Oh, my and gosh. I mean, what is it's different? A, it's called, it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's called Pause for Hope. But I really wanted to use my knowledge to help I mean, you know, the secret of being happy is being appreciated. And, you know, there's no greater appreciation from an animal that's been saved. And you find a home. So it's impossible to be unhappy. 
And I, you know, I encourage people to, you know, find a rescue and, you know, foster a dog. If you can't have a dog, foster a dog. And Absolutely. you can have it for a week or two. And and people are like, I could never do that. It's just too hard. And, and I'm like, well, try being the dog that, you know, is getting put to sleep or you know you gotta you gotta think beyond that <laughs> right and, yeah absolutely and you know we I compartmentalize I compartmentalize it because I have two fosters right now and you know we're gonna find them in a home and it'll be a good home and it's like well I can't keep them but it's it's interesting to just see the progression and 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 you know I think as a social worker the really the hardest thing about having an illness and what you have to adjust to is you don't feel like you're valued. You feel like you're a burden. And by doing these types of activities, it just lifts your spirits. Absolutely. And, you know, art is another outlet and exercise. I mean, there's so many different things that people can do to help lift their spirits. Meditation. Um, journaling. Don't watch the news. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Avoid us. That too. You know, don't get in a fight on next door with somebody you don't <laughs> agree with. These things are not positive things, you know. <laughs> um, but, but I have to say, you know, talking about emotions, I do find that people, you know, you're dealing with the anger part when you're emotional, right? Your anger and you want to fight. So you want to get on next door and fight, you know, I mean, they're obviously feeling it inside. So, um, you know, there's better ways to get that out, get a, get a coloring book. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Now, you know, how do you meet with patients? How often? And, uh, are are you meeting in the clinic? Do you meet online? What does your work day look like? One for Cineas, we as social workers should be in the clinic. So the visits are typically face to face. Every once in a while, it might be via telehealth. We do have a pretty robust telehealth program that we rolled out at the beginning of the pandemic specifically for our home therapy patients. And so some visits can be done via telehealth or a phone call the optimal visit would be face-to-face. Regarding frequency, it really depends on the type of clinic that the social worker is in. We've got really large clinics, but we also have teeny tiny clinics that are very rural. Um, And so some social workers might cover two to three clinics. So they travel in between those clinics and might visit the patients once a week. Um, but they definitely should have access to the social worker, even if they're not in their physical clinic, they can call the other clinic to reach out to the social worker. Uh, but for the social workers who cover the larger facilities, they're there every single day. They might be, you know, chilling in the lobby while patients are coming in to say hello and greet patients and family members as they're being brought in or taken home just to show face and just to touch base with the patient. They also should be rounding with their provider and the rest of the interdisciplinary team. Uh, That's often done on a monthly basis. Uh, But access to the social workers while the patient is on treatment is imperative. So it could be physical location, face-to-face, or via telephone. And, you know, it's also the social worker helps with issues of, like, housing and transportation and, of course, financial problems. I mean, you know, with, you know, everybody's experiencing financial problems right now. It's really probably impacting care. I mean, I heard um, on one of the bulletin boards, um, you know, there are some people who are saying, I I can't afford the gas anymore. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I can't afford, you know, food. (laughs) Mm -hmm. or that I used to get. So I'm sure these issues are also brought to you a lot and how to address them. Right. And that's one of the values of having a social worker in the dialysis clinic. We have the ability to provide counseling, provide support, provide education, but also provide referrals to needed resources. We basically are... um, investigators of 
resource. And so if we have a patient who says, I can't afford my gas, then with Fresenius, our social workers know there are grants that are available for our patients to help afford transportation as needed, or their insurance might cover a couple of trips back and forth to dialysis if they're having problems affording gas or a family member is unavailable. So the social workers have access to um, that knowledge and they'll plug the patients in as needed to help them continue life-sustaining treatment. And there's also, I mean, I remember early on my social worker was when I was transitioning from a teen to an adult. And, you know, there's a lot of getting back to work programs and, you know, different things that a lot of resources out there, ticket to work for people with kidney disease. I mean, um, letting people know that they have options to go pursue their dreams. Yeah. And what I find valuable with our company, with Fresenius, because we're such a large company, the social worker is not alone. There are social workers all over in whatever area the social worker is in, whatever region, whatever state, wherever they are, there is a social worker that they can reach out to to say, hey, my patient is struggling with access to maybe wanting to return to work, as you mentioned. Do you have any suggestions? Have you ever dealt with this before? What do you recommend? And so we really encourage our social workers to network with one another to support each other so they understand they're not in this alone, they're, that we're all here together. Well, and it's, it's so important because I get questions all the time about, you know, I'm on PD, but, you know, I don't want to tell my employer that I'm on PD or and I'm like, wait a second, don't be ashamed of your illness. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, it's a reasonable accommodation. And well, I hate to say it, but once you disclose you have the illness, you actually have a little more protection. <laughs> This is true. Yeah, that's true. You know, from uh, you, you have a little bit more protection. And I used to do PD when I was at work in my office, and it was mm-hmm. fine. It was nobody was. Uh, it didn't bother anyone, and I got my treatment done, and I got mm-hmm. my job done. So it's really important to know how to integrate it in your life. Um, I know that a lot of times that the social worker gets the call that the patient's not showing up for treatment. <laughs> Right. And, mm-hmm. and what, what magic do you work <laughs> to get people to come back? There's all sorts of conversations that can happen when a patient kind of goes rogue. One of the things that we try to do is prevent that from occurring. So really trying to be present and supportive when the patient is there, you know, recognizing them for their strengths acknowledging that they're there, that they stayed for half an hour, whatever it is that they can handle versus acknowledging that they're not coming or they're missing. It's really important from an interdisciplinary team perspective that we try to get ahead of the problem. So for example, let's say that I was a patient on dialysis and I usually come in with my hair done, wearing lipstick, And this is my social life. This is what I do. Um, This is when I see my peers. And this is when I hang out with my friends. That's how I look at dialysis. And then one day I just stop wearing lipstick. But if I'm not approached and told or asked, is everything okay? I noticed you're not wearing lipstick. Then maybe I eventually might stop doing my hair. And I stop with the self-care. It's important that our direct patient care staff notices those things and lets the social worker know because the social worker can get involved and kind of be preemptive in reducing that individual patient stress level, their feelings of being a burden, Mm -hmm. their frustration towards having to do this every week, three times a week, or every day of their home therapy. And really trying to support the patient, encourage them, keeping them motivated, engaged, and part of the process. As long as we do that as a team, we tend to see better success with our patients. 
by the time they are missing and we get a phone call that says, you know, Anna has missed three treatments now. We, we can't get in touch with her. Then the social worker has to pick up there. There's a lot of backpedaling that needs to happen to try to figure out what's the root cause here. Is it depression or anxiety? Is it frustration towards loss of control? What can I do to bring that patient back to a sense of feeling supported and loved through this process? and encourage them to return to get their full treatment. Because we know that that causes long-term negative effects with shortened and missed treatments. We all know that in the medical field. But we also understand we are dealing with individuals that are usually adults that are going to make their own decisions. So before it spirals to the point where they start to really test the waters, we need to recognize that there's a couple of ripples that are happening and let's meet the patient. Let's chat with them and make sure that the patient's doing okay. Well, and I, I think, you know, it's so great that you don't put people in the spot like, Oh, you didn't do this or you didn't do that because you know, that's a, that's the fastest way to get somebody to turn, stop listening to you. <laughs> Um, oh, yeah. And, and, you know, really, it's a lot of, it goes back to dog behavior. I hate to say it, but you get more with uh, positive reinforcement than you do with yelling at the dog. Yeah. <laughs> right. Nobody wants to be yelled at and nobody wants no. negative. And then also, I think that people don't realize if they're seeking a transplant, can you talk a little bit about compliance and transplant. I mean, because, you know, patients who want to transplant, um, you you can help patients find a center or something like that to help them. But does the transplant center know if the patient hasn't showed up? Because that can impact their ability to get on a list, right? Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad that you brought up transplant because Fresenius is working diligently behind the scenes to create a very meaningful transplant process for our patients, for our clinic teams, and for transplant centers. Um, It's going to be extremely collaborative, and we're really excited about the things to come with transplant. That said, one of the biggest pieces with a successful transplant journey is transplant readiness, and making sure that the patient understands what does it take to get a transplant? How long might it take? What questions am I going to be asked? What's expected of me? And really increasing their understanding and health literacy of the process and including them in the process. So if we're able to increase the patient's understanding about transplant and how adherence impacts their ability to receive a transplant, ideally they would be less likely to miss and shorten. With that said, if they are struggling with missing and shortened treatments, usually we're touching base base with the transplant centers once a month. Our social workers and the case manager in the transplant center have a monthly call where they just kind of review the patient's in that specific dialysis clinic and where they are in the transplant journey. Are they still in evaluation? Are there concerns about uh, post-transplant care? All of that type of thing. And so if the social worker in the clinic notices that there are missed and shortened treatment issues and they're becoming a trend for the patient, they would be likely to talk to the transplant center about it. And it will challenge the patient's ability to receive a transplant. Now, we don't want to use adherence as a carrot, you know, to say, well, if you're not adherent, you can't get a transplant. It's really the patient's decision. But we do want them to know that staying for their treatment, coming for their treatment is optimal for their body and for their their physical medical body to be able to receive a transplant successfully. And that's why adherence is so important. It also reflects that you're setting your body up to accept 
a new organ in the best situation possible. You're going to care for it. You're going to respect that organ and it's going to last up to, I mean, how long have you had your transplant, Lori? Well, it, third, it can last a really long time. My third one lasted 20 years. Mm-hmm. And my fourth one's been 11. My first two didn't work. I mean, it was in the earlier days when, you know, they just had like prednisone and Imuran and, and, and a prayer. <laughs> and, uh, and then, you know, my was, that was pretty much it. Um, but, you know, the technology is so much better now. And it's, it's, it's important. I mean, you know, people, as you know, think transplant is a cure, and it's not. It's another form of treatment, and it just sucks you have kidney failure <laughs> because you're always in that stage, even if you have a transplant. Right. I, I think it's really interesting, though, that we were creating some data on the transplant list um, to put on our website to help people kind of navigate and understand the different centers, and over 40% of patients are inactive on transplant. And we're really trying to get patients to, you know, because if you're in a hospital and you're sick, you become inactive. And uh, we're trying to encourage patients to, you know, find out so that box gets checked back on um, because everybody's busy <laughs> and you have to be your own advocate. Right. And, and it is. And I'm like, you know, you, you can get a transplant anytime because, The wait list can be three to 10 years, whatever the number is of where you live. But if a kidney goes to a person at a hospital and you're second or third in line, there's a reason for that because Mm -hmm. of the fact that if the first or second or third person can't get the kidney because they're not well or something's going on, then, you know, you could get a kidney faster. So there's always hope. (laughs) Right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's you know, trying to give people that feeling of, uh, don't give up. It'll, it'll be better. <laughs> Tomorrow will be better. It's um, hard. It's very hard. I mean, it's an old cliche, but this illness isn't for sissies. You know, from the sticks. I mean, when I go in the hospital now, you know, whatever I'm dealing with is not the biggest issue. It's just I have not, I don't have the best veins. Mm-hmm. And that becomes the most problematic is getting an IV. I mean, I... I, mm. and, and, you know, a lot of us experience other things that are, you know, more complex than they used to be. And, you know, empathy goes a long way. <laughs> yes, it does. And listening. And listening. Listening and, is an amazing thing. And just saying, I'm so sorry you have to go. Oh, that really sucks. I mean, we have support groups um, at RSN. We do like exercise support groups and we do Zoom support groups. We used to have an in-person one prior to COVID. We may start that back up. But it's really interesting to me because, you know, people just want to know that they're not alone and that somebody understands. One friend can make a difference. (laughs) And, Mm -hmm. you know, I see it over and over again when people come to a support group and they feel like they don't have a future. And then at the end, by hearing everybody, they feel better. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's such there's so many resources out there, but, you know, you got to look for them, guys. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, to your point with support systems and support groups, it's so important for people to just know they're not alone. Right. Um, They don't have to do this alone. There's so many people out there that that can relate to their struggles. So, exactly. It's so so true. As we all know, there's a shortage of everything in this country. And, uh, you know, it's a a huge shortage of nurses, a huge shortage of of healthcare professionals. And social work is a great field. Tell us a little bit about, you know, what you advice you would give to people who are considering social work. One thing that I would recommend is having a sounding board, someone that you lean on on bad days because you will have hard days. It's important to share your emotions and your experiences with, it's usually another social worker. Um, I tend to lean on my supervisor when I have a rough day. And also to remember, social work is not for the faint of heart. You know, we're, we're very, very empathetic people and we take on the emotion of others. And when we're dealing with high emotion, frustration, 
coping adjustment issues, depression, anxiety, we're taking that onto our shoulders. So remember to release it, whether it's through art or animals or exercise. I'm a horseback rider, so that's, that's what I use. It's just so important to do self-care. Um, so lean on your other social workers to release your bad days and to, and not unleash, you know, you don't want to like <laughs> get upset and angry, but just talk about it. Don't hold it in and give yourself space for self-care. It's exactly. so important. Well, and it's an excellent point because, you know, dealing in the nonprofit world with the uh, renal support network, I do hear a lot of sad stories and, mm-hmm. and it's, it can be, it can be overwhelming because you, you know, it's the same thing in the animal rescue world. Like, oh, my God, I can't save them all. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I certainly try. It's frustrating. So, you know, I've come up with a strategy and I invite some friends over and we bead and bitch. <laughs> and I put some yeah. beads out and, um, you know, I love it. <laughs> you got to create the environments. You make it positive. But, you know, it's 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 you, you know, girlfriends are, are wonderful. And, you know, they can they can be your best sounding board (laughs) yeah Um, absolutely and you know we still I also tell people who have kidney disease too that you know don't always complain to your family I mean find another outlet you know because they can't help you um you know they definitely want to hear you but that's why it's so important to connect with other people who've been through what you've you're going through because they're going to be able to help you learn how to navigate this illness from experience. Yeah, absolutely. It's so important. Any closing inspirational thoughts about, you know, living life and that you apply? Yeah, I think that it's just important to remember not every day is a beautiful day, um, but find beauty in those ugly days as best as you can, because the next day the sun will eventually shine. So keep your head up and stay positive. Remember that there are people out there to support you. No matter what walk of life you're in, there are people who care. And you just got to ask for help. Sometimes, you know, asking for help is just the first step. That's exactly what I was about to say. Like, speak up. Just say something. If, If you're feeling down or if you're feeling overwhelmed, just speak up. That's all it takes is like, I need help. You know, it's it's not it's okay to say you need help. Mm-hmm. So absolutely. Well, thank you, Anna, so much for sharing your story and your dedication to um, people of kidney disease, and also for you know being an animal lover. I, I think I have a kindred <laughs> spirit on the absolutely. East Coast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and good luck with your rescue. That's that's wonderful. I'm uh, all of our. All of our babies are rescued. They're the best kind. You know, it's just animals are the most nurturing creatures on the planet. And if I, I just wish everybody had the feeling of knowing the love of a dog. Yeah. And, you know, it's uh, I have a very dear friend who she's one of my long term friends with kidney disease. And I met her in the early 90s. And, you know, she just never grew up with dogs. She Mm -hmm. just never, you know, like, uh, no, they're not for me or mom didn't like them. And I was like, okay, normally you're not my tribe, but there's something special about you. (laughs) (laughs) And and, uh, my husband and I ended up visiting, you know, she got married and visited her in Florida. And I walked in the house. I'm like, yep, definitely no animals because I can tell the energy in an ant house when I pick it up. And her Mm -hmm. husband was like, just wanted an animal so bad. He was like, and so I kind of helped the matter because she had met one of our dogs who was a cockapoo that, you know, she's like, oh, Chloe's special. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, yeah, they're all special. But and so we we uh, we started sending pictures, her and I, you know, to <laughs> of rescue dogs in the area that look like Chloe. <laughs> mm-hmm. So she ended up getting a dog. 
And she even shares today that I can't believe how much this dog and how much I love him. He's like a child. (laughs) And, and, you know, she's like, and it's helped her get through, um, you know, she had to transition back on dialysis with her transplant and just the amount of unconditional love this dog has given her. She credits him for helping her survive. And she's like, I'm one of those converts now. And so um, it's really true. They, they're they very healing. And if you can't have a pet, I'm sure that, you know, you can do something with pets uh-huh. that in the area. So, well, oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, great, Anna. We'll have a wonderful day and uh, we'll catch up soon. Thank you, Lori. You too. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to Kidney Talk, a program of Renal Support Network. Please make sure to find us on Facebook or sign up for our newsletter at rsnhope.org. Kidney Talk is intended for informational purposes only. It is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment from your physician. Always seek the advice of your own health care provider regarding your medical condition.